I was sitting in your seat and I was thinking, I want to be up here one day. So here's me back at Columbia. My boyfriend was like, are bit emojis even cool still? And I was like, I think so. <laughs> um, so just quickly about me, uh, I graduated uh, from here in 2013, textile apparel management, marketing merchandising um, track with the business minor. I was also a, a YMA scholarship recipient, like almost everyone here, which really spearheaded my career into New York. I also swam here at Mizzou from 2009 to 2013. So it kind of gave me a different path than everyone else because I didn't have the opportunity to internship uh, during my college years because I was here swimming the entire time. Um, I moved to New York two days after graduation with four suitcases and my mom shipped me a box and that was kind of my start, bought all my furniture at Ikea. And then I started my job at Coconut Grove Intimates, working in intimate apparel for Splendid and Ella Moss, which was licensing at a very small company. And then since then, I've been at PVH in supply chain for the last four years. Um, supply chain is very interchangeable with product development, sourcing, operations. So depending on the company, it depends on how they kind of say it. So to give a back history, I read the, this book, The New Roles of Retail, in college in 2012. And I came across it while I was moving in with my boyfriend actually recently. And I thought it'd be interesting to reread it, having a different perspective of the industry from being in college versus now being out of school for five years. So just kind of summarize it real quick and then go into understanding value differently, which I got from this book. So you have the first wave of really the industry of the catalog business and what Sears Robox did, um, getting product to consumers living in the middle of nowhere on farmland and getting furniture and anything you could ever think about in the catalog. So that was really like a 100 year period. Then you go into wave two of mass market from 1950s, 2000s, and that's when you think of like the JC Pennies, the Macy's, really the big mass market um, product that everyone wanted to do the same thing. Also is when advertising was hitting, so it was like keeping up with the Joneses, you have this refrigerator, I have that refrigerator. Um, and then you have the next period which is becoming shorter and shorter as like social media becomes more prevalent and things are moving quicker. And that is your customization experience. And that's the lifestyle brands that have kind of hit. Um, you're getting away from mass market. You don't want to wear the same thing as your friend. You want to be different and you want it to look like you're the only one that has it. So unfortunately, we had the recession in 2008 to through 2010, which really changed our industry. And it's a really interesting time because it was when I was going through college, fortunately. But then what's come out of it since? I think with that mass market into that customization period, you could really sell anything on the floor and the customer was willing to buy it. And it could be really low quality and it was just flying off the shelves. But you hit that 2010 mark and um, it's you're seeing value differently. So that's where kind of my theme comes into play. Um, so in the book, they kind of they discuss the retail apocalypse and the meeting they had with the CEOs. So there's 11, C, uh, 11 companies with 11 CEOs on here in 2008. And then, so I looked at where are these CEOs today? Well, there's only four left. That's just showing the change in the industry uh, in the last 10 years. And we're having to work harder to make the consumer buy our product. So... 64% of CEOs are no longer with that company, which is insane. So that's understanding value differently. So you have the customer that's smarter and more educated because they have technology, they can pull it up on their smartphone, they're going using the internet, really cost comparing, understanding product, understanding fabric. And then uh, you want a user experience. So you want someone to you know, dress you at the store. You want to see what that lifestyle looks like. You don't just necessarily want to walk into a store and like shift through racks all the time, unless that's the experience you're looking for with like Marmax, where it's like a tre uh, treasure hunt looking for a product. But that's also an experience within itself. Um, and then also there's multiple channels of distribution with Omnichannel, Amazon, um, you can buy stuff on Instagram these days. Like, you can literally buy something whenever you want. You guys be sitting here buying stuff now. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where the industry is coming into place with business, the three business models of wholesale, retail, and manufacturing all going together. Um, so you really want to be working with your cross-functional partners 
uh, that being your sales team, your design team. You don't want to work in a silo by yourself anymore, but you want to co-collaborate. And you also need flawless execution. So going from design and a concept on a piece of paper all the way to the retail store, you want to make sure everything is executed correctly and you're paying 100%, you're looking at things 100% and you're not running into any issues. The worst thing that can happen is a product arriving at the store and it's folded incorrectly or it has the wrong hang tag on it. Like a pant having a straight fit when it's actually a slim fit, you should see how it blows up in our office. Um, you also want to think outside the box. So there's constant things on a day-to-day -day basis where someone's going to tell you no, and you have to figure out how you are going to get there because you have to get there. So it's a matter of changing a fabric to make sure a sample comes in. You, you just need to do something differently. Think outside the box. And when someone tells you no, really um, figure out how to say yes. And then you want to be customer focused. So your end result is always the customer. Um, you don't really want the product, you want to know who that product is going to when it hits the store. And I think that's the most important thing that sometimes gets overlooked because we sit in our world of design and, and sales and we don't think who's actually buying the uh, product and what are they looking for. There needs to be a purpose for the product. So I'm just giving you an uh, example now of a project I worked on with a pant and understanding value differently. So the pant was a stretch twill five pocket. It was being sold to Costco. Um, it's also men's pants, so not super glamorous. It was like brand was bass, so your rugged customer, that's probably your dad. <laughs> um, so we all sat in this room. We had this, we had this amazing looking five pocket pant. And um, the people that were in the room for this meeting were sales trim, so that's people doing elastics and uh, zippers and actually Jerica, basically. <laughs> um, fabric people, so your raw materials. And then I work with the factory, the designer, um, me being in supply, and then my operations team that deals with the timing of the product. So we all got into this room. We saw this pant that was at Macy's that we, we had sold to Macy's and we wanted it to be at Costco. Well, Macy's price point compared to Costco price point is a little bit different. So we worked on um, cost engineering the style. So making a couple tweaks to the style so that we were able to sell at a certain price point and um, the customer would still find value in the pant. Well, a Costco customer sees value when like, it's a heavyweight fabric. They don't like lightweight fabrics that are drapey. They want substance. So um, we used a fabric that was pretty heavyweight to feel like it was substantial. Uh, we resource the elastic quality. Elastic's like really big for men's pants right now. For some reason, they find value in that stretch. They're finally like understanding what women have gone through. <laughs> and uh, so resource that quality with a different supplier. Um, also made it closer to garment sewing. So made it in Bangladesh. And then uh, we removed a pocket from the pant. We figured, well, that customer's not gonna use that pocket. Why are we spending the extra 10 cents to put it on the garment? Um, and then we leveraged our raw materials. So that means that uh, other brands are also using that fabric. So we're able to negotiate based off of volume. So I think we brought the price of the fabric down by like five cents per yard, which is equivalent to like eight cents per garment. And then from there, we also uh, negotiated on the garment. So there's actually 600,000 units of this pants sold to Costco. So I was like, okay, factory, like you're gonna get efficiencies. You're gonna have this production running for two months. Um, I was like, can you please give me a discount on this product? So I think I got like a 10 cent discount there too. And so all this work that we did as a team and we looked at like the value of the pant and what the customer wanted resulted in uh, $1.2 million of savings on just one pant alone. So that was pretty incredible. And it's the work that you can do when you like break down the silos and everyone works together on something, there's a really big opportunity, so understanding value differently for the customer. So I just wanna say thank you. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. And then I forgot business cards, which I really apologize, but there's my email right there. And I really wanna thank the faculty as well, to Katie's point. We wouldn't be here with it, uh, if it wasn't for you guys, and we really appreciate it, so thank you.